This is the story of a killer. A man so elusive, he slipped from the law's grasp a half dozen times. A chameleon, constantly changing identities, allowing him to kill across three different countries. Close on his trail, a global crime-fighting organization called Interpol. Jurisdiction, the world. When crimes are committed, an international organization unites police officers to deliver justice. Interpol investigates. The story that will span 28 years begins in the lazy resort town of Pattaya, Thailand in the mid-1970s. One morning, a fisherman in a longboat finds the body of a woman floating in the water. He alerts the Royal Thai police, who rush to the scene. The coroner examines the young victim and questions the fisherman. With no identification and no signs of foul play, the woman is most likely a Westerner who's had a swimming accident. The coroner fingerprints and examines the victim, but still can't identify her. A toxicology test reveals alcohol and hashish in her system. The medical examiner has seen several cases like this in her career. An unsuspecting tourist falling prey to the waters off Pattaya. What she doesn't yet realize is that there's a killer on the loose. The police canvas area hotels to see if anyone has reported a foreigner missing. But foreign tourists come and go all the time, without notice. No one reports her missing. It's as if she never even existed. And after two months, another discovery grabs the attention of the Royal Thai Police. A worker driving his truck near the very same beach notices something unusual in the brush. He finds the body of a second young Western woman murdered. Police comb the area but find few clues. She's a young woman, perhaps a student on an overseas vacation, but she has no identification, no purse, no wallet, no passport. Police don't connect her to the earlier victim. In the beginning, there was no alarm raised over this. Covering the two deaths, reporter Alan Dawson. People didn't really correlate for a while the appearance of, of one body and then another. But one person paying attention is Sampal Sutamai, a lieutenant colonel in the Thai police department and also the head of Interpol in Thailand. 
The similarities of the cases don't catch his eye. The differences do. They were both found near the ocean, but the conditions of the bodies were different. The police report stated that the second woman was murdered, deliberately drowned. This discovery raises doubts about the first young woman. Perhaps her death was no accident either. A sinister pattern of anonymous female victims could be developing. John Imhoff, former director of Interpol's U.S. office. The Thai officials have a problem on their hands. They have dead bodies. They have no identification associated with them. They know they have an investigation that they have to pursue criminally. But one of the key steps to getting that started is the identification of the victim. The morgue releases pictures of the victims to the Bangkok Post. Tens of thousands in Southeast Asia start their day with this English language newspaper. Police hope that one of those readers could provide a lead. But days later, the two women in the morgue remain unidentified. The body count now grows, this time a man and a woman. Like the others, they're clearly young Westerners. And undoubtedly murdered, they'd been set on fire. The bodies were still burning when they were discovered. This was a horrific crime. Flames had scorched the faces of both victims. Police look for anything, some sort of identification, some kind of lead. All they can find, a tag on the woman's clothing that reads, Made in Holland. The Thai police now have four dead Westerners, no leads and no motive. They rely on forensic clues to reconstruct the latest murders. The woman was beaten with a hard object. The man was whipped, strangled until he couldn't breathe. The coroner also finds soot in both of the victim's air passages. The couple was burned alive. This is a terrible, inhuman act. The person who did this has an evil heart. Out there among the fun-loving tourists stalks a killer without a conscience, a predator with no motive and no limits. Three women and one man, all between 18 and 25 years old, are dead. Police hope that word flies along the tourist trail and that someone somewhere might have crossed paths with any of the victims long enough to provide a lead. But the killer travels faster than the news. Striking almost 1,400 miles away at the end of the trail in Kathmandu, Nepal. Both Nepal and Thailand recently joined Interpol. But the rudimentary communication between the countries fails to alert Nepalese officials that a killer is on the loose. Then, police discover two bodies outside Kathmandu. A pair of Nepalese boys stumble upon the grisly scene. An unforgettable sight for both the children and the investigators. The woman had a wound on her chest and the man had a wound on his neck. They were so damaged, it was difficult to see much more. Kathmandu detective Bishwa Lal Shrista investigates both murders. When we saw the dead bodies, the faces were burned. They were naked. We had no idea who could have done this. Securing the crime scene, the police turned the boys back. Stop. 
but too late to protect them from the gruesome scene that lay before them. The Nepalese police surmise that the anonymous couple traveled together. Adventurous Westerners soaking up the culture of Nepal. And in Kathmandu, that almost certainly means a visit to the tourist mecca of Jun Chentol, also known as Freak Street. Investigators begin their search there, in the hotels and hostels that cater to travelers. At one lodge, a clerk remembers that a pair of the guests had not returned for several days. Their names, Pierre Beaumont and Vanessa Wilson. When police search the room, they find most of the travelers' belongings, but not their passports. We also found a diary. We found the name Alain Gautier from Bangkok written inside it. Guests in the room next door come by when they hear the police activity. Concerned about the missing couple, they tell police everything they can. One remembers seeing Vanessa Wilson with a man who claimed to be a gem dealer from Bangkok. The police ask the traveler's friends to come to the morgue. They identify the bodies of Pierre Beaumont and Vanessa Wilson. But the two police departments still aren't in communication. What will it take for Interpol to stop this serial killer? In the Far East, police find six young Westerners murdered under similar circumstances 1,400 miles apart. As separate investigations continue in Thailand and Nepal, police don't realize they're chasing the same man, Charles Sobraj. Interpol is trailing Sobraj for crimes in India. John Imhoff, former director of Interpol's U.S. office. Charles can present a persona that is what the people want to see, not what he really is. So if he wants to assume a false identity, he's practiced at this for a long time. The woman killed in Nepal met with a gem dealer named Alain Gautier, an alias used by Charles Sobraj. Throughout Kathmandu, officers search for more leads. At one hotel, a clerk remembers a guest matching the description, but not registered under the name Alain Gautier. Alain Gautier. He claims to be a Dutch national by the name of Carl Gassel. The clerk recalls that Gassel drove a white car. It isn't much to go on, but police must run with it. They search throughout Kathmandu, setting up checkpoints, stopping dozens of cars, and interviewing the occupants. An officer pulls over a car that matches the description. The driver calmly produces passports, identifying himself as Carl Gassel and his wife, Ida Bosch. Police call off the search and escort the couple to headquarters for questioning. The man claims to be a scholar, his wife, a Dutch television star. He insists he has never seen the murder victim before. When the witness comes in to identify the man she met with Vanessa Wilson, she draws a blank. She can't positively identify him as the same man she saw with her friend. 
Kathmandu detective Bishwa Lal Shrista. In Nepalese culture, any foreigner or guest is treated very politely. And we didn't look at him suspiciously. False identification can be very difficult for the investigator. Documents can be reproduced and they can be made to look authentic. The police let the couple go. The man they know as Carl Gassel and his wife return to their hotel. The investigators all the time are coming this close to capturing someone that needs to be brought to justice only to see them slip away because of their identification changed or because they were just a minute too late. Um, so that's, that's a huge frustration. Days later, a Kathmandu policeman takes a statement from a witness who saw a white car near where the bodies were found. Amazingly, she remembers the license plate number. It matches the plate on Carl Gassel's car. And then hard evidence. Police find two arrival cards for the victim, Pierre Beaumont. The signatures don't match. A handwriting expert determines that the second card shares characteristics with Carl Gassel's signature. And it was dated December 24th. The same day Pierre Beaumont's corpse rolled into the coroner's office. The police conclude that the man they know as Gassel had left the country and re-entered Nepal using the dead man's passport. The cool, calm professor was a cold, calculating liar. Police now have a case against the man they think is Gassel. They hurry to make the arrest. But it's too late. Gassel and Ida Bosch are gone. There were clothes all over the place. Documents were all over the place, including passports and gasoline. We also saw things to alter the passports. After we found that evidence, we were certain that the killer had slipped away. Police have no idea where to find him, and it will be months before the information they've gathered reaches Interpol. Reporter Alan Dawson. The communications were not like they are today at all. By the time authorities could really make their case, uh, it was quite some time down the road and he was long gone. In Thailand, authorities still have no suspects and no identities for the four dead Western tourists. Interpol chief Sampol Sutamai searches for leads. It's very unusual that a large number of foreigners were murdered. Nothing like this had happened before. Usually foreigners come to Thailand to relax and have fun. They don't come here to do wrong or break our laws. So we were investigating the possibility that the killer was from Thailand. While Thai police attempt to identify the victims, the Dutch embassy in Bangkok receives a vital clue. Herman Nippenberg is the most junior diplomat at the Dutch Embassy. He receives a letter in the diplomatic pouch about a missing Dutch couple traveling in Thailand. The family was very worried about the fact that for a period of over six weeks, they had not had a sign of life from a couple who were ardent correspondents. 28-year-old Nippenberg can't imagine how important the couple's names are. Carl Gassel and Ida Bosch. The relative has only one lead. In the missing couple's last letter, they wrote that they had made a sophisticated new friend in Bangkok. The man was a French gem dealer who was helping Ida and Carl buy precious stones. Frenchman had been very hospitable, had uh, taken them to dinner, 
and had invited them to his apartment. They were not completely sure if this Frenchman was genuine in his intentions. They thought that there might be an ulterior motive from the Frenchman. But since that letter, nothing. The family asked the Dutch embassy to help find them. They felt worried and I felt that they might have reason to be worried. Hermann Nippenberg contacts Thai authorities and gives them the names Ida Bosch and Carl Gessel. But the Thai police have no information about the missing couple. Nippenberg has to find someone who knows this mysterious gem dealer. He gets a lead from a friend at another embassy. I learned from the Australian consul that an Australian couple, youngsters traveling, had been drugged and robbed by a French gems dealer. Nippenberg locates them and discovers the name of the gem dealer, Alain Gautier, but little else. In a city of four and a half million people, locating Gautier would prove next to impossible. But Nippenberg catches a break when he learns of a woman who knows the suspect. Working after hours, he arranges an interview with the woman. She lives in the same apartment complex as Alain Gautier. Her name is Nadine Gier. She tells an extraordinary story about a devious and ruthless killer. Several months earlier, Nadine met a French-Canadian woman named Marie Leclerc, who moved into the building with her husband, Alain Gautier. Marie told Nadine that Gautier was extremely possessive and would probably kill her if she ever tried to leave. When Nadine expressed concern, Marie told her that she was joking. Nadine soon learned otherwise. My informants told me that Gautier was an extremely dangerous person. He was also charming and lured young foreigners into his apartment. Nippenberg learns about one guest who got sick, left with Gautier, and never returned. People had a way of disappearing from the Alain Gautier apartment. They suddenly went on trips from which they never returned, leaving their jewelry and bags and passports behind. Nadine soon learned he had two willing accomplices. A.J. Chowdhury had earned a chilling reputation. Chowdhury was uh, considered a killer who took great pride in showing people his knife. Marie Leclerc cultivated more subtle skills. She had a great knowledge of pharmaceutical uh, things. She could inject people. She was considered the poisoner of the three. And then Nippenberg got the best news yet. Nadine had actually met the missing Dutch couple, Carl Gessel and Ida Bosch. And significantly, while they were buying gems from Alain, the couple fell suddenly ill. Not long after that, Gautier and A.J. Chowdhury whisked the sick Dutch couple away. Then one of Gautier's guests showed Nadine a picture from the Bangkok Post. They could see on the photograph in the newspaper that these people who had been murdered in such a cruel manner that they were wearing the clothes of the Dutch couple. Nadine now believed the horrifying photo of the burned couple found outside Pattaya showed Carl Gessel and Ida Bosch. She had to find out more about her dangerous neighbors. With Gautier and his two accomplices on a trip to Nepal, Nadine entered their apartment. In a safe, journals, 
passports, jewelry. In a suitcase nearby, syringes, drugs, everything that the charming host Alain Gauthier would need to kill his guests and assume their identity. Now, afraid for her life, Nadine contacted a friend at the embassy who contacted Nippenberg. She took something from Gautier's apartment for proof. Ida Bosch's diary. She gives it to Nippenberg, along with press clippings about other murders and missing persons cases. Nippenberg reads the articles. And as he looks over the headline about the murder outside of Bangkok, he has a recollection. The thing which had stuck in my mind was that the female had worn a t-shirt with a label in it, made in Holland. Although not a police officer, Nippenberg finds himself in a position familiar to many investigators. Circumstantial evidence points him toward a solution. But he needs concrete proof. He gets that from the dental records of Carl Gassel and Ida Bosch. I just entered the morgue and suddenly from one of the corners of the room came this voice which said, Mr. Knippenberg, I found it. It's them. And at that moment I knew that our worst fears were becoming reality and that it was the young Dutch couple which had been murdered. While Thai police search for the killer Charles Sobrage, he assumes the identity of Carl Gassel and the alias Alain Gauthier to escape murder charges in Nepal. But police in two countries have not made the connection. Interpol will have to put the pieces together and pick up the killer's trail. In Bangkok, Dutch diplomat Herman Nippenberg suspects gem dealer Alan Gauthier of murdering a young Dutch couple. But he hasn't realized that the gem dealer is serial killer Charles Sobrage. I had already very, very strong suspicions that more young people of roughly the same age and of a similar background had come to an end in a similar manner. Nippenberg compiles all the evidence he has secured into an exhaustive study of the killer's crimes in Thailand, connecting the deaths of the two unidentified women with the Dutch couple. His research uncovers the unsolved murders in Kathmandu. I also saw press reports coming out of Nepal which described exactly the same operational method vicious killings followed by burnings with gasoline in Nepal. Nippenberg submits his report to the police, who take it very seriously. The Thai police and an undercover squad raid Alain Gauthier's apartment. Inside, two men and a woman. The woman's name, Marie Leclerc. She has a valid passport. With her, A.J. Chowdhury. Papers in order. Steve Watson, I don't know where he's at. So Braj produces an American passport. Now he is calling himself Steve Watson. The police bring them to the station for questioning. They also confiscate the apartment safe.
But amazingly, Sobraj convinces police that he really is an American named Steve Watson. And authorities cannot refute his phony passport on the spot. John Imhoff, former director of Interpol's U.S. office, explains why. Every document can be replicated. And if he is sufficiently skilled or he knows the right people who are sufficiently skilled to help him prepare an authentic looking U.S. passport, now, there's no reason why the Thai officials would question that. The safe Nadine Gere found full of stolen passports is now empty, except for some receipts. No evidence, no case. And for the police, no choice. They hold the trio's passports but have to let the suspects go free. When the police stated to me there had been no proof of their criminal activities, I was, of course, quite flabbergasted. I could not stand idly by and have a group of completely innocent young people be uh, slaughtered without anybody lifting a finger. But Nippenberg had also delivered his file to Interpol's National Central Bureau in Bangkok. Chief of Interpol, Sampol Sutamai, now knows more about this elusive killer's true nature. I understood from the beginning he had to commit more crimes. He has a true criminal nature. He doesn't care anything about other people. He only looks after himself. No one in Thailand knows the killer's real name, but Interpol follows close on his trail. His luck is about to run out. In Canada, agents track down the parents of Marie Leclerc. Oui? They learn that she had given her family a phone number in Paris of a woman by the name of Madame Sobrage. At Interpol headquarters, agents run the name Sobrage through their international database of known felons. Finally, they trace the alias Alain Gautier to the wanted killer, Charles Sobrage. They put him on their most wanted list and post a red notice to member countries around the world. You have an ability to very effectively disseminate to 181 countries instantaneously information about a particular crime pattern. And when people are moving across borders, it's important that you be able to disseminate that kind of information uh, readily. So Braj is already wanted in India, where he has earned his nickname, The Serpent, for his uncanny ability to slip out of the grasp of the law. And now, the serpent slithers away again. Following the murders of six young Westerners in Thailand and Nepal, Charles Sobraj, the killer known as the Serpent, is on the run throughout Asia. Interpol has issued a red notice on the fugitive, placing him on the organization's most wanted list. And although already wanted in India, Sobraj enters the country and in no time is apparently struck again. In New Delhi, a young Westerner is found murdered in a tourist hotel. His passport and money gone. The coroner determines death by poisoning. Three days later, police respond to a mass poisoning of over 50 tourists at a New Delhi hotel. A group of French students claim their tour guide poisoned them. Police recognize Sobraj as the phony guide and immediately take him into custody. Reporter Alan Dawson is not surprised by Sobraj's bold act. I think Charles really thought that he could do anything he wanted to do, and he wanted to show his power over these people by poisoning them. 
and Charles went down that day. Authorities arrest Sobrage and Marie Leclerc, charging them with poisoning the students. Their usual accomplice, A.J. Chowdhury, was not with them and has never been seen again. An Indian court finds the couple guilty. Leclerc gets eight years, Sobrage 12. But it takes more than iron bars to hold the serpent, and authorities underestimate his devious nature. So Braj and Leclerc are incarcerated in Tihar prison. But the charismatic Sobraj manages to gain special privileges. He exploits the media to toy with authorities back in Thailand. Reporter Alan Dawson visits him several times. I asked him about the murders. He says he is familiar with the victims. He knows what happened to that person. And he makes it very obvious that he was in, directly involved in what happened to that person. And on one visit, a disturbing revelation. He proceeded to draw me a map of a place in Pattaya with X marks the spot where a body was buried. And when I came back to Thailand and I gave that map to the police, and they went to that spot and dug where it said X, and they dug up a body. Thai authorities really did want Charles to come back here, face a court, be found guilty, and be shot. Extradition proceedings have already begun as Thai authorities try to bring Sobraj back. They have until 1995 to try the serpent for multiple counts of murder before the statute of limitations runs out. Chief of Interpol in Thailand, Sampol Sutamai. I went to India to strengthen our extradition request. The Indian police took me to see Charles Sobraj in prison. He knew why I was there. He knew that if I was successful and he was sent back to Thailand, he would die. He would be executed. We had plenty of evidence. Charles told me that he feared one thing legally, and that was to be sent to Thailand. The Indian government refuses to extradite Sobraj until his sentence is complete. Years pass, and the serpent plots his next move. On his 10th anniversary in prison, a former inmate returns to visit his good friend. He brings candy. Charles generously offers it to everyone. Within the hour, prisoners and guards pass out. So Braj slips out of jail, a deadly fugitive on the loose. And no one knows where the serpent will strike next. A man of the world, escaped killer Charles Sobraj, the serpent, could be anywhere, hiding nearby or slipping out of the country. Without a moment to lose, Interpol reopens its file and notifies its members that the serpent is loose. New Delhi police assign a surveillance team to stake out the serpent's old hangouts. Three weeks later, New Delhi detective Madhukar Zendi spots a man who looks familiar. Then I focused on him. I realized that he looked like Sobraj. My heart started pounding. It seems too easy. How can a man famous for eluding the law be so careless? Now it is time to arrest the serpent yet again. 
the agents make their move. The serpent receives an additional 10 years for the escape, but it's exactly what he wants. Charles said later, the reason he staged his escape was specifically because the time was running out on his real sentence in India, that he faced possibly being freed from Indian jail. Uh, he, Thailand had filed extra, his extradition, but that if he escaped from jail in India, that he would not be extradited to Thailand. And that's exactly what happens. India will not extradite a criminal still serving a sentence. While Sobraj does the additional jail time in India, the statute of limitations runs out on his crimes in Thailand. When his sentence is up, he'll be a free man, even free to kill again. In 1997, Charles Sobraj is released. Chief of Interpol in Thailand, Sampol Sutamai. I was very angry. I wanted him to be tried and punished for his crimes in Thailand. He killed a lot of people here. His old accomplice is gone. Marie Leclerc died of cancer in 1984. But Charles Sobraj is never tried for the murders of the two people who were found burned to death outside of Kathmandu. Nepal has no statute of limitations on murder. A warrant for Sobraj's arrest remains in effect 28 years after the crime. In that time, Ganesh KC, the young boy who discovered the burned bodies, has joined the Kathmandu Police Department. He has never forgotten the sight. It was the first time I saw a dead body. It was a foreigner, naked, burned. I was really very afraid, terrified. Then, in an odd twist of fate, six years later, in October 2003, the serpent returns to Nepal. A journalist snaps a few photos and sells them to the local newspaper. We couldn't believe that Sobraj would come here, so we called the paper. They said we're certain it's him. Two days later, as Sobraj enters a casino in Kathmandu, Ganesh and his men arrest him. I was delighted because I thought that this might give another opportunity to find justice for the two Dutch victims. Nepalese investigator Bishwa Lal Shrista hopes his patience will be rewarded. We people of law, we believe that justice may be delayed, but it should never be denied. Justice shouldn't die. So Braj denies he had anything to do with the murders. And justice might still prove elusive. Ganesh KC and the police in Nepal have a difficult task. Reconstructing a case almost 30 years old. They turn to Interpol. It was important for me to get as much evidence as possible. The international community and Interpol offices in different countries helped us to solve this case. The organization provides an extensive dossier on the serpent, the fruits of their investigation. John Emhoff. When you have a pending investigation, you're not going to destroy any records associated with that. As long as these cases are outstanding, whatever information comes to Interpol will be collected and stored. 
the dossier gives Ganesh the evidence he needs to secure a murder conviction against Charles Sobraj. Sobraj has to pay for his crimes. He has to be punished. The souls of his victims will now rest in peace. After a 28-year chase, on August 12th, 2004, a Nepalese court sentences Charles Sobraj to life in prison.